And to me, it's always about having an open mind and going into a workshop and going, you know, what can I take away from this? So our hope today is that you have an open mind and, and you listen to what we have to say and that you can take something away from this. Uh, for me, it was always, uh, you know, if I can take away at least one thing from a workshop, then I considered it to be a successful workshop. If I could take away more than one thing, even better. So please have an open mind, uh, and if you have questions at the end, certainly we will do our best to answer those. Uh, but you will need a piece of paper for today, uh, one of the activities that we're going to do. We'll try and get you involved a little bit. Uh, so if you can just have a blank piece of paper uh, available for this, that will help you with uh, what we want to run. Awesome. So we uh, want to ask you a question um, and it's what grade do you teach? And if you're not a teacher, um, please, you can comment why you're here or um, how this is kind of um, important to you in any way. So if you're not a teacher, um, please still you can respond to this question. Just kind of give us an idea of why you're here and what um, impacts you. Fantastic. So Faye has put up the, uh, the quick poll. Uh, through the program. So you just simply need to click off uh, one or more. If you're uh, teaching in one or uh, more than those levels, then please just check it off and then hit submit. Uh, that will allow uh, Faye to have an opportunity to let us know what it is you're teaching because, you know, it may affect, you know, kind of the direction we're talking about as we go through the program today. Uh, and as Michaela said, we're, we're not even sure if you're all uh, teachers. Maybe there's something else that you are doing. Maybe, maybe you're in the healthcare. Maybe you're in summer camp programs. Maybe you're in after school programs. Um, hopefully we've got something that we can offer to all of you. So yeah, as uh, again, depending on where you are in uh, Canada, uh, that might look different. So we put the actual grades on there. So whether you're a primary uh, educator, doesn't even need to be a teacher, could be a educational assistant, teaching assistant, uh, special ed teacher, uh, so many different things. So primary is the K to three, junior is the four to six. It looks like 70% of you have responded. So we'll give a few more moments and uh, we can close the poll after. So I see a lot of responses in the chat as well. Um, and uh, so Christina said she works in inclusive sports and recreation. Oh, fantastic. And we have coaches and primary junior PE teacher, um, teachers uh, for grade nine to 12. And Kaylee is uh, working in inclusion services for recreation programs. Oh, wonderful. We have uh, Erin from Therapeutic Recreation. Welcome. <laughs> A lot of people working in inclusion, so I, I think this workshop will be really helpful. Fantastic. That's we really hope so. <laughs> okay, so we'll close the poll right now. And... Uh, Share result. Awesome. Okay, that's a little bit of everybody in there. So that's uh, really interesting to see and, and, and very informative and will help us out. Fantastic. So once Faye uh, gets us back I to will, me, we'll yep, continue. I will hand it back over to Chris and Michaela. Fantastic. Welcome back and thanks for uh, filling out the poll, giving us an idea and uh, welcome. It's so good to see so many people uh, in the inclusion world out there because there's so much need for that. So, uh, so welcome. All right, we're going to continue on. Okay, so can everyone take their right hand for me and touch their forehead? Um, and I can't see a lot of people, so I, I am hoping that you do this with me. So touch your forehead and send it out to the screen. Awesome. Take both fingers, press them towards each other, towards your lap. Good. Bring them up to your chest, up to the ceiling, and then point to the screen. Good. We're going to do it one more time. Touch your forehead. Send it out to the screen. Put your fingers together towards your lap. Bring it up to your chest and then to the ceiling. 
and then point towards the screen. So that, you just ask me, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you for asking. I'm doing good too, can I? <laughs> sure, just ask her. Uh, so this is uh, communication. Communication is such a key important part, uh, especially in students that have cognitive differences. It's important with all of the students and the individuals that we work with, uh, but especially with those with cognitive differences. And quite often we fall back to uh, only one method of communication, that verbal method of communication, and we realize that that's not sufficient. Uh, to be inclusive with all of our students. We need to learn how to use so many different types of communication. Uh, this being American Sign Language that Michaela has taught us a simple thing for is, uh, is a fantastic method of communication and is uh, growing in importance uh, and use worldwide. Uh, there are even people right now that are using it for newborns, that when, uh, when children are born, they're using it right away before they can use the other forms of communication. So there's verbal communication, there's sign language, there's body language. Uh, there's, there's so many different types of communication that we can use uh, that this is just kind of a, a reinforcement from us to let you know that using though all those types of communication is really going to help you uh, in dealing with any student with cognitive difference. Awesome, so we talk a lot about cognitive differences and, and what is that? So some examples, and this is not um, all of them, but autism spectrum disorder, so including Asperger's and autism, Down syndrome, brain injury, which is traumatic brain injury or can be acquired brain injury, um, a concussion is cognitively different, um, and then on the other side you see dementia, so young onset um, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, um, so when we talk about cognitive differences, these are just some of the examples that you might see. So kind of the, the bulk of what we want to talk about today is what you can do as uh, an educator, as uh, a person working with students, uh, is how can you help them? Uh, and we're going to talk primarily about four kind of concepts that we'll, we'll delve into. And those concepts are, number one, making sure that simplified instructions are there. Uh, when we look at our executive functioning, uh, our ability to concentrate, our ability to uh, have, hold attention to things. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll also talk about uh, another concept which is a sense of fair play. Uh, that's huge uh, with certain individuals, not all, uh, with cognitive differences, but making sure that things are fair as we go through things. Social interactions we know are often uh, one of the more difficult things for people with social differences to uh, work their way through. And by being aware of those and knowing how to deal with that, it helps uh, you as you're running your program, whatever it is that you're running, whether it's a specific program, like we're hearing of people that are running recreational programs for uh, individuals uh, in that format, or whether it's just a regular classroom teacher or a phys ed teacher who's got uh, you know, a few students that might have cognitive differences. And then the fourth one that we want to delve into is sensory issues. Uh, quite often, those with cognitive differences uh, will have different sensory issues that need to be addressed as we go through things. So basically, it's about educating and applying the strategies that we're going to talk to you today uh, in your role, whatever role that is. And we do see from that that we've got people all the way from, you know, teaching kindergarten all the way up to post-secondary and in other areas. So hopefully, as we go through these four things, it gives you some tools uh, to help you take away. Yeah, so concept one that we're going to be talking about is simplified instructions. Okay, so this is when I want you to pick up your piece of paper. Okay, I'm going to trust that you're doing this. And I want you to build a paper airplane. So I'm going to give you about 10 seconds and I want you to fold it however you want for it to fly through the air. So look across the room, pick a target, and I want you to build something that's going to fly across the room. Okay? Don't copy me. I know mine's perfect, but <laughs> make your own. Be your own person. Awesome. So while he's doing that and while you guys are doing that, um, why, why am I asking you to do a simple, simple task? And it's, you know, um, a major, major thing not many people think about. And it's the ability to stop, think, plan, and do. So it's stop what you're doing, think about it, plan it. So can you visualize it in your head? And then can you execute it? 
And these four things are the main function in your brain, which is executive functioning. So executive functioning is the ability to stop, think, plan, and do. And when individuals have cognitive differences, they might have a hard time starting a task. They might have a hard time finishing the task, um, understanding what the instructions are, um, tend to get their emotions involved with things. And these are, these are some things that you might see when you ask for a simple thing like building a paper airplane. Also, just a, a fact is individuals with ADHD are 30 to 40% behind individuals that are neurotypical. So until we understand executive functioning and how our brain works, we're not going to be as helpful as we can to allow our students or whoever we're helping succeed. Um, so now you can launch your paper airplanes to the target you picked. Or the target could be Michaela, <laughs> or the target could be me. I'm gonna throw it at the computer and hopefully uh, I'm aiming at Michaela and not myself. Because this is, you know, the epitome of perfection in <laughs> paper airplanes. Okay. Oh yeah, nailed it. Awesome. So the biggest thing for this, and it might sound silly, but it's keep it simple, right? Don't throw a million um, steps at someone if they have a hard time starting the first step. Do it one at a time and keep it simple. The best way to kind of analyze that is, you know, if you were taking one of the traditional sports, uh, one of the most difficult ones, which is uh, which is baseball, because of so many different rules that are involved in it. And if you were to throw all of the rules uh, at a new individual to baseball and say, go play this game, they're going to be lost. I know in some of my classes, uh, there are lots of students that have never played baseball and we play variations that are even much simplified yet they're still completely lost. We can all probably remember that time when the person either kicked the ball or hit the ball or threw the ball or the object out into the field and then ran to third base instead of first base because that's just one simple instruction that they need to get through. So in the game of baseball, you're not going to do that. You're going to break it down into simplified instructions, in step instructions, in layering things on top of each other and building on that. So maybe the first thing is that you teach somebody how to project the ball out into the field without anything else going on. So we're just practicing whether it's kicking the ball, hitting the ball, throwing the ball. It doesn't matter. Once you learn that, then you can bring in the second simplified instruction and build on that. Now that we've got the ability to hit the ball, what do you do next? Well, you have to run around the bases. You don't even do that. I would go back to the rounders variation where there's only one pylon and you're running out to the pylon and back so that they don't have to worry about directions. It's layering, it's keeping it simple, and then it's allowing them to be able to concentrate on the one thing that they need to do, pay attention to that one thing that they need to do, and of course, that's what the whole executive functioning thing is kind of based on yeah. uh, as we go through. And, that. and taking a simple building a paper airplane and then heightening that game, right? Um, giving them a different color. So then you have a blue paper airplane to build and then your target is the blue bucket, right? So then you're doing color coordination. So you're adding on to a very simple activity and potentially making it more creative. And throughout the, the resource, that's what it does. It shows you how to build those steps and, and work through those things. So concept number two is? Sense of fair play. So sense of fair play is a, is a big one with students with uh, cognitive differences. Um, it needs to be fair for everyone. If they perceive that the rules are different from one person to another person, then they're going to have a great deal of difficulty with that. So you've got to make it set up so that you're uh, fair. And we'll talk about kind of unfair, uh, as Michaela has already set us up here for a game a book. But we're going to do a variation first that many of you have probably heard of called head and shoulders, knees, and comb. We're actually going to play head and shoulders, knees, and greenfish. That's not the name. <laughs> Show go. Uh, but, so it's a fairly simple game. All we're going to do is, in a normal game, we'd have somebody calling it, but we're just going to call out body parts, head, head, shoulders, knees. can be any body part you want, as long as you keep it clean. Uh, and then when you hear the word go, we're going to reach for the fish. The person that gets it is the winner. So we're going to show that to you quickly. So following along, head, shoulders, knees, shoulders, Head, knees, go. 
Woo! So in this game, I am the winner, um, and there is a potential loser. Um, there's a point system, so then I could say, okay, I get one point, you get zero points. Um, this gives me the opportunity to win multiple times, um, if not every time. Um, so it's kind of fostering a sense of unfair play. So we're going to do it again, and we're going to show you how to do it with fair play. So you can see there's a green fish and there's a red fish. And we have two signs right here. So the red fish, it says five chicken jacks, and the green fish, it says five dino jacks. So we're gonna play this game again, but now there's two options. So we're both going to win, but we have to do something with the action, okay? So we'll try it again. Head, shoulders, knees, head, Shoulders, head, shoulders, knees, shoulders, head, knees, toes, knees, head, shoulders, go. Fantastic. So because we have clear instructions ahead of time, they're fair ahead of time, neither one of us is going to feel like we're the winner or the loser. We both got our special fish, uh, and now we're going to do our activity that is very similar. Uh, they're not the same activity, but they're generally the same. So Michaela uh, is going to do her five chicken jacks. If you haven't seen chicken jacks before, you've got chicken wings on, uh, and she's doing hers. And I'm going to do my dino jacks. So I'm doing the dinosaur. So I'm going, I'm doing five of them. And then we're playing the game where the game has now become uh, fair to both of us. We both have clear expectations as to what we're doing. So a person, person with cognitive differences uh, wouldn't see that as unfair. They'd be able to play that uh, and enjoy that without having any difficulties because, as we said, it's fair. Yeah, and if you have a group, you can line them all up and then every, every round you switch partners, right? So then it's not the unequal partners. Everyone is playing with someone else. You can have multiple color, multiple things. If you don't have colored fish lying around, you can use different color balls, different color noodles, um, uh, pencil, um, you know, paper, simple, simple things that you can make actions out of. And when you're changing so that they're playing against different people, uh, as Michaela said, we're not changing from one player to the next based on a win loss. We're just based on, you know, we'd probably say right side of the line. You guys are going to shift one spot over to play a new person so that it's not the winner that's moving on and or advancing, uh, as uh, a lot of people like to call it. Uh, it's just a great way for us to uh, make that fair play. Awesome. So concept three is social interaction. So social interaction is a huge thing. Um, and you see it a lot with team sports, right? And the, the idea that we need to play in team sports. So. Yeah. And, and, and most, I, I, I shouldn't say most, but I, I should say in a lot of programs, we see a traditional uh, team game program that is set up where you're typically playing in your phys ed program, you know, basketball, volleyball, baseball, uh, ultimate frisbee, all of those games that are team oriented. And we know that uh, a person with a, a cognitive difference is going to struggle with that because they have to interact with their teammates. They've got to communicate with those teammates. It becomes very difficult for them. Uh, so it's well known that individual pursuits are certainly better for those students with cognitive differences. So making sure first that you have a varied program. No, it can't be all team and it can't be all individual, but if you've got a variance in there, uh, students are going to enjoy it. And even within the team sports, try different team sports. It doesn't have to be traditional basketball. Uh, there is a great sport out there that I'm sure most of you have heard of called chukball, uh, which was actually designed for people with physical differences to be able to play with people uh, that are fully able-bodied. So stop playing, adjust the traditional ones and move into those things like, you know, ultimate rubber chicken and chukball and all of those great things and then bring in the individual stuff. The individual stuff I know just really hooks the students in. Uh, at Clemens Mill, we often, uh, for years and years and years, we have done a circus skills unit. And I can tell you without a doubt uh, that my students that are on the ASD spectrum thrive 
in that. Uh, and they thrive in that because of uh, another concept that we didn't talk about, which is uh, repetitive behavior. And with the repetitive behavior, they like to do the same thing over. So for an example, I had a boy a few years ago uh, that when we were doing our circus unit, I introduced a circus skill called poi, which is, if you've seen it, it's the, the flaming circles that spin and we do them with socks and balls. Uh, he went out and bought his own and brought it in and used it every single day. He was just absolutely thrilled that we were doing that. So individual team, do some new creative things. Uh, think about uh, that your program isn't just for your athletes. A lot of times we run a program that's based just for athletes, training them to be you know, super, the next superstar. Uh, think about those students that aren't athletes. Uh, it's not just your students with cognitive differences. It's making sure that you're thinking about them. What are they going to enjoy? Um, and then of course, uh, the differences. So whether it's physical differences or cognitive differences. So uh, I know I'm going on a bit about this one, but I'm kind of passionate about this and, and the way this program is set up. Uh, my school for years, um, when we did play team sports, we set up the program so that it was uh, a very different setup. As you can see there on the screen, it, it was called competitive and fun competitive. Rather than have one field playing a full football game or whatever it is, we would have multiple fields. Um, you know, minimum two fields, depending on the number of students that you have, sometimes upwards to four or five fields. At one end, you would have the competitive group. The competitive group would be those students that want to keep score, uh, that want to win, because uh, you do have those kids, students in your program. Then at the other end of the field, we uh, eventually called it fun competitive. And it's those, uh, that field was for the ones that uh, they just wanted to learn the game. They wanted to have fun while they were playing the game. They didn't want to feel any pressure from other people. And then depending on the number of students that you have, you could have a middle field uh, or even more. And it just kind of progresses from one end to the other. And it actually makes it more, uh, they have a better chance of being successful to, regardless of who they are. If you're an athlete and you're on a field uh, with the more athletically minded students, uh, you're going to tend to thrive and show your skills a little better. If you're on the fun competitive field, you're actually going to get more touches on the object because the people are actually going to pass it to you. You're not going to feel any, um, you know, in some cases it's even bullying where students are getting mad and angry at students because they're not uh, doing what they want them to do. And quite, off, uh, quite honestly, that's why a lot of students have dropped out of phys ed when they get into the higher levels because of the pressures that they feel. This setup allows them to thrive within a phys ed classroom. When we started doing this, we had next to no students show up without gym uniform. They wanted to participate because they knew they were going to be uh, included and, and make that work. Sorry, I went on a little bit. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to show you an example of this. Um, so a simple thing you can do is get construction paper different colors, put them around any area. So if you're working in a gym or if you're working in the classroom setting anywhere, put them on the ground and you can play basketball, soccer. And for us, we're just going to play a little target game. So um, you're going to have the color blue. I'm going to have the color red. So I'm going to find the red squares on the ground and try to shoot the ball into the target in the red square. Once I have, get, once I have got it in, when I'm standing on that square, I go find another one, which is the same color. Okay, so it's a it's a team sport. So if you're a phys ed teacher and you want to, you know, look at um, basketball skills, um, this is a great individual activity, um, but a team kind of sport. If that makes sense. Ideally, if you have poly spots of different colors, this works fantastic because you don't want to put anything on the floor that uh, your students are going to flip on. Uh, we're just using it as an example here, but yeah, poly spots work great. So we're shooting at the nice happy face bucket here. I like the happy face bucket. We'll see, uh, game is on, ready? So, so I got it in, so I'm gonna find another square. I can get it in, so I'm going, I don't need to go back to the same spot based on this. I'm just gonna shoot, uh, and every time that I get it in, uh, I feel successful in what I have done. And I'm just going to keep going. We're in a small space here, so you can tell that this you know, can obviously be spread out into a huge area, uh, and then you can just work from there. But uh, that's called spot it. Um, on a side note, if you don't have poly spots, I have a bunch of black poly spots that are just uh, inner tube 
tractor tires that are cut into circles. Uh, they work great. They're not colors, but they do work. And if you have no idea what he's talking about, you can just use colored construction paper. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so just kind of how does this game, for example, address that social interaction that we talked about? Uh, first, it's taking a traditional uh, team game like basketball that we were kind of emulating there uh, and it turn, turns it into an individual game. I'm not playing against Michaela, I'm just working by myself and I'm still allowing that skill development uh, without any direct interaction which uh, they find the most difficult. Uh, it incorporates some sensory learning into there when you've got the colored spots, the colored paper, the colored whatever that you want it to be. Uh, you know, sometimes it's even colored cones. A lot of us have different uh, colored um, pylons that we can put out. Gives it that sensory learning that can help you with uh, the student's ability to concentrate and, and pay attention. Awesome, so the fourth concept is sensory issues. Um, so seeing, hearing, touch, smell, taste, um, those are all things that we can incorporate into our activities that we're playing um, and do it very simply. So we're going to play a game called Infinity Soccer. So with this, you can play it in a group. So as you can see in the picture, there's two kind of spaces in the, in the circle of groups, um, and that would be the goal. Today, uh, we're just gonna play kicking um, through each other's legs as kind of the goal. So see, we're using a really small kind of ball. So we're gonna try it a few times. So because it's small, I might have a hard time grabbing it. I might have a hard time potentially seeing it. We're going to switch it up and we're going to use a big yellow one. Okay, it's soft, there's a different feel to it, it's colorful, and it also has a smiley, surprised face on it. So this activity to allow for different senses and different things is um, you can simply just draw some different facial expressions so surprise angry happy and every time you hit the ball and you you put your hands on one of those emotions you can get the people to do those emotions right so now you're involving the touch um and you know different colors you can use different colored balls depending on what people like you can even ask what people's favorite color are right it totally depends we're going to play it a game again Obviously, the game's a little easier with just the two of us, uh, but you get an idea. And that's an emoji for those of you who aren't up on your technical terms. Awesome. And you can change that kind of concept and idea to any game that you're playing, right? If you're playing volleyball and you're finding that the students are having a really hard time with the regular volleyball, why can't you show the skills with a, a bigger ball, you know, the odd time to have fun and, and to be inclusive or do a game that involves smells and, and going to find things in the yard that, you know, uh, different types of flowers or essential oils, right? You can incorporate senses into your games and you can see that students and people really enjoy these and can really succeed if you kind of work to their uh, benefit. Uh, and, and I see that somebody was asking what a poly spot is. Uh, poly spot is a uh, piece of equipment that you can get from pretty much any store. They come in round, flat circles. They're kind of like a rubbery plastic that sticks to the ground so that they don't slip or slide like construction paper would. Uh, and you can get them in multiple different colors. So you can throw those all over uh, a playing area and the students just go to those poly spots. Uh, and I said you could make your own just from uh, inner tube tires, so yeah. Awesome, so communication strategies. So if you are working anywhere, um, you don't have to be a teacher for this. It's just simple, even communication with your day-to-day -day friends or people around you. It limits the distractions. So is there music playing around? Is there a lot of people? Um, kind of what is going on in the environment? Be aware you're playing a game and you have music blasting and you're finding it's really distracting, even if you like the music, it might not be beneficial for the people that are playing the activity. Get the person's attention. 
So the biggest thing that I find teachers do is if they look down and then they, they go to get activities or go to get the equipment, right? That's not getting the person's attention. So someone that has cognitive differences might get totally distracted of what that person's doing and really lose the instructions. Um, speak slowly and clearly, okay? Slow it down. You know, don't rush. Um, if you're playing this massive game and you only have 10 minutes to um, give all the instructions, well, maybe it's not the perfect game to play in that moment, right? Um, give one message at a time. So again, with the simplified instructions, one step at a time. Um, repeat the information and show and talk. So give the, give the instructions and then play the game and then give the instructions again, right? It's okay to repeat it. It's okay to give the information again because that will allow people to succeed. So this one to me is kind of, it really hits at home. Um, you know, we've all heard the term inclusion over and over and over again. Uh, and, and I'm not just talking about cognitive differences. I'm talking about so many variances in inclusion. Um, we're kind of specifically talking about um, cognitive differences here, but we're looking at the difference between inclusion and integration. And I've heard that from a number of people uh, that I've talked to about this concept that many uh, people working with students understand integration. Yeah, now, integration is just when you assume that something is wrong with an individual uh, and, and they have to fit into your preset system. That's not what we're looking for here. Uh, what we're looking for is true inclusion. True inclusion, uh, which is where all children are considered to be different and, and all children can learn. So what you do is you have to set up your program so that you're able to include all students. And, and yes, I'm gonna generalize from just the cognitive differences here to physical differences to so many different other things. Uh, you know, you can even get into ethnicity, gender, all of those things. And true inclusion is they fit in without any change. It's just, it's the way you run your program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and that kind of lies under the person-centered planning. And it's recognizing that everyone is unique and everyone is different, right? Everyone thinks differently. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses in different things. So develop things that are gonna allow everyone to succeed. And the biggest thing is that if people are diagnosed, they are people first, they are not their diagnosis. So they are not an autistic person, they are a person with autism, they are not disabled, they are not handicapped, they just don't have the use of their legs. Right? If we start changing our language and how we address um, individuals, it's going to change our mindset too, right? We need to internalize and then we can project, right? So that's very important. Um, and the other thing is putting everyone in the like in the middle of your decision making, right? So if you're developing a program, don't develop for yourself of how you can succeed because you're different than everyone else that's going to be doing the program, right? Put yourself in people's shoes and what will they need to succeed? And, and that's when we talked about the fun, competitive and competitive um, field is how do we allow for that to happen? And it's, it's creating an environment that gives people dignity and respect, right? Um, and then, the, the other thing that I find so important is the participation and collaboration. Some of the best people in my life and the best teachers were the ones that got involved and did the activities with me. And I have the same philosophy for seniors is that they want to play games and they want to do activities, but they, they don't want to be told what to do and they don't want you to watch them do this activity. They want to do it with you. And that's the same as, as students and, and kids, right? They want to participate with you. So if you're creating a program that you don't want to participate in yourself, I'm sure the people that you're running the program for don't either, right? So allow yourself to develop a program that you can play with too. And then that allows you to evaluate it better, right? How do you know a program's going to work if you're not actually playing it, right? If you're right in there with whatever program you're running, you're going to be able to see what needs to be worked, what doesn't need to be worked and evaluate yourself. Right? Just some ways to allow for, for the person centered planning. Awesome. So, one of the questions that we assumed we would get is for those of you who are in the education world, uh, how do you assess a student with a cognitive difference? Uh, basically, what this comes down to is hopefully not too much different than all of your other students. <clears throat> it needs to be based on your curriculum expectations. Here, I put down Ontario because we are from Ontario and that's what I've worked with for the last 30 years. 
Uh, I've looked at two of the strands, the active living strand, which is active participation. It doesn't matter what your cognitive ability is. You can still participate as much as any other student can. Your physical fitness. Uh, cognitive differences doesn't change your ability uh, to be physically fit. Um, safety, again. Uh, personal safety and safety of others. In fact, quite often we find that people with um, cognitive differences are even more aware of those things uh, than some of our others. And then as we move to the second slide of assessment, we look at our movement competence. We're looking at the ability to uh, have skills, concepts, strategies. Uh, and when we get into those things specifically, uh, it may come down to whether or not the student is on, here in Ontario we call it an IEP, an Individual Education Plan, where it's written down as, uh, as to what uh, accommodations they need to have. Um, but what we're, Michaela and I are trying to say is that if you run a program that is truly inclusive and you've thought about all the things that we've talked about and probably tons more, assessment is just going to come naturally. You don't have to change things necessarily. Uh, if you're running a program that is open to those people. Yeah. So, overview. What have we uh, gone over today? What are the takeaways that we hope you will take home from you today? So, the four areas, the four concepts that we talked about. Simplify your instructions. Step by step, layer it. Sense of fair play. Uh, make sure that it is fair for all students and that nobody feels like they're getting the short end of the stick. Social interaction, be aware that uh, some students might have difficulty with that social interaction. We even know that students can't even find a team sometimes, let alone be on a team. Uh, and then finally, the sensory issues are very important. You know, how can you help those five senses or incorporate those into your program? Um, yeah, and communication strategies, just being able to communicate effectively the inclusion versus integration, so how to develop a proper program. Person-centered care is putting those people at the center of your planning um, and then assessing it. So that's kind of the, the overview. And before people start to, to leave the workshop, thank you so much for coming. Um, but I just wanted to touch upon the Any Game for Any Brain. Um, if you like these activities, there are so much more in this um, book. And, you know, it is so beneficial for anyone really um it doesn't matter if you're a teacher or not um this is a great resource um that will help you kind of guide to hopefully a more inclusive program and a, a more inclusive narrative that our whole kind of society can start changing the way we discuss and, and we do things and we did do four games today from the book we did uh the fly away, which was the paper airplane, we did spot it, we did head and shoulders, knees and go, and we did infinity soccer. Just examples of ways that you can incorporate games into your program that are going to accommodate uh, all of those students. Yeah, so in the next slide, um, I'm going to give the contact information for Sierra Ontario of where you can actually get the book. And then if you are interested in the senior side of things, um, you know, you work with seniors or you have a loved one and you're more interested in learning about that, um, please reach out to me personally. I put my business um, website on there um, and my contact information. So yeah, all of the, uh, as Michaela switches the slides, we'll see there's the, all of the contact information, both Michaela's, both our cell numbers are there, our, uh, our personal, uh, our emails are there. If you want to contact us directly, we're fine with that. Uh, and as well as the website for both Senior Support Services and Sierra Ontario, uh, we're there to help you. Uh, and, and we would like to help you as much as we can. So we're now going to turn it over to uh, Faye, who is going to get into the Q&A portion of it. Hi, Faye. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm back. Um, and thank you again, uh, Chris and Michaela. This is a great uh, workshop, and I am sure that our attendees have learned a lot. And we're now going to go begin to answer some of the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions throughout this uh, uh, Q&A section, um, and you can find the question panel in your attendee control panel. So our first question is from Jalco, and the question is, how will you organize competitive and competitive games in a rather small space? Uh, Small-sided courts uh, it, it is probably the easiest. Uh, it's, it, we need to get away from using a full court, uh, even in a small gym, 
Uh, if you've got, you know, a small primary gym that would typically be, you know, even half the size of a regulation basketball court, uh, you can still run multiple games within that same area. Uh, you know, if you're running, um, you know, my best example is a game I use called Kunkin, which no one will know about except for a few. Uh, but in a, a small area like that, I could play four separate games uh, of Kunkin. Um, the same thing, even volleyball. Uh, in our gym, we created a volleyball net that strung across the entire gym, not just one spot. It went from wall to wall. And within there, we used tape and separated the courts into four smaller courts. Uh, and then, you know, instead of playing six on six, you're playing three on three or, or, you know, two on two or four on four, whatever your numbers are. And then it allows you to have, you know, competitive at one end, fun at the other end, uh, and, and then those students don't have to uh, play with each other. <laughs> be where they don't want to be, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And next question. So when it comes to uh, selecting teams, do you let the students choose their teams or do you want the educators to get involved as well? Um, okay, that's, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, <laughs> but usually right at the beginning uh, of the year in all of my units, we would actually have an entire day where the lesson was how to choose teams fairly. Um, are there ways for students to choose their own teams uh, and still be fair? Yes. Uh, you know, the old schoolyard pick where there's two captains, in my mind, should never happen anywhere. Um, even in our classes, we had co-ed classes at the K-8 to level and we never had boys versus girls. We're all equal, we should be spread out equally. It's all about that inclusion. So there are lots of ways. Probably the most typical way for us to do it uh, is depending on what field they're on, they simply just line up randomly and then one student will go along and say, team A, team B, team A, team B. Yes, you still have some students that will try and cheat a little and line themselves up because they know you're gonna alternate and go A, B, A, B, A, B. So then you change it up and you go A, A, B, B, A, A, B, B. Uh, there's lots of different ways. We could go into this forever. You know, there's everybody throws a shoe into the middle and you know, you just throw the shoes out and, and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes they're not fair. And, and we teach our, our, our students right off the bat that if you're 10 minutes into a game and you've got one team that's destroying another team, switch it up. Switch it up. No one's having fun. And by switching it up, I don't, I don't mean, uh, hey, you, Bobby, you're the super athlete, and, and you, Billy, you're the horrible athlete. Let's switch you two to make it even. Yeah. That's centering students out. It's let's start from the beginning and do it all again. If you do it right, you can do it uh, very quickly. Anything else, Dad? Yeah, some like basic things. Like I've done, like, would you rather eat ice cream or eat chocolate? And then separate the room and then play that a few times until you kind of see that the rooms are separated enough. And you go, okay, here's your teams for the next game, right? So creating like a little fun intro game that will break the students or whatever group you have up. And then you can go into whatever activity you have based on kind of that little game that you started with. And sometimes your students with cognitive differences need a little help, a little nudge. Uh, they're a little, a little reluctant to even go anywhere. So sometimes, it, you know, you need that extra help to get them in there. And, and you know, systems like that will help you. Yeah, like them. a creative way where they don't really realize that they're picking their, their team. And then they're like, okay, this is our, our team for the game. Another fun, I've actually done a fun game. Uh, called Parts and Numbers from Sierra Ontario, where you just, at the beginning of the class, you say, okay, everybody in a group of two uh, and touch elbows. So we get in two and we touch elbows. And then you say five, uh, touching fingers. Uh, and, you know, you keep doing that five or six times. And then your end goal is you know how many you want on the teams. Mm -hmm. So you've just divided it. And by the time you get to the end one and say, okay, uh, groups of five, uh, you know, touching shoulders, and you say, okay, great, there's your team. You go play, you go play, you go play. So you can even pick teams in a fun way, uh, which is great. And our next question is asked by Maria. And she is asking, when you divide the class into competitive and competitive, is there any issues around segregation? Do you have students participate in both environments? Uh, it's actually better than in a normal scenario. Uh, simply because they now want to participate. 
I, I've, I've had phys ed teachers that have actually said to, uh, you know, the, the more athletically minded students, well, you, your next goal is to help those students that are struggling. Uh, they don't want to do that. I mean, it's a great leadership thing, but they may not want that. And it's also centering out people, you know, and it, it, they might not be struggling. They just don't want to keep points or they don't care, right? So. And, and and I really don't have students that are kind of sitting out or not participating because they're feeling like they're included. They're they're, they're feeling like the, the teacher has made it so that it suits them and it works for them. So, yeah, we tend to get a lot more participation than anything. So we're, when we're talking about games, there are some good feedback. So Brent said uh, he would have kids paired up and play rock, paper, scissors. And we have Nick said uh, he's using a, an app called Team Shake. So those are all good ideas that yeah. we can yeah, apply. Yeah, great for us and other people. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> and next question is by Laura. Can we get more examples of what a circus unit would look like? Oh, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so circus unit, uh, ours has kind of expanded over the years. And now that I retired this year, it's actually still going strong. Uh, but we started it about 12 years ago. I actually have friends that are uh, part of Cirque du Soleil in Vegas. So, uh, you know, I've had a kind of a passion for that you know, circus sport. So we started off with just a few skills and, and now uh, we introduce two new skills every day. So day one, for example, might be we teach them how to juggle with scarves. Uh, and then day two, the scarves are still out there, but then we may teach them how to do two new things. So we've got in our unit, let me try and remember all of these. We've got juggling with uh, scarves, um balls rings pins boxes uh no chainsaws that's just not uh, not allowed uh, i don't think that would meet the safety code uh balance things we have things that you're balancing on so we've got roll of bola stilts um uh what else do we have unicycles and then we've got other things where you're trying to balance stuff. So we've got spinning plates and uh, we've got Diablo sticks. Uh, we've got flower sticks. We've got, it, it just goes on and on. <laughs> so we have an actual blast. And every day, as I said, we introduce two more uh, circus things. Um, and skill sets, right? You, you teach them a new skill yeah. and then they go practice it on their own. So the idea of repetitive behavior, right? You're teaching a skill and then students can go pick what they are passionate about and practice that. Um, yeah, and if you want more information on that, by all means, send an email and I'll, uh, I'll share some stuff with that. But yeah, love the circus unit, love it. So, um... After the circus unit, we have a, a harder question, and uh, it goes, how do you deal with young children making racist comments, such as, I don't want him to be my partner, I, I don't want her to be in my team because their skin color? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, that, that's a tough one. It's, uh, you know, we, we would like to think that uh, that racism is, is disappearing from society, and, and to some degree, I think it's, uh, it's lessening without any doubt. I, I certainly think it's gotten much better, but there, unfortunately, it is still there. And yes, you still do have those students that will make those comments. Um, so first off, I would say, uh, deal with the situation before it even happens. Don't be afraid to have a lesson you know, again, where 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 we would build a lesson into our unit right at the beginning about how to how to make teams, we also have a, le a lesson on inclusion and the fact that you are going to have students of different uh, skin color, uh, different gender, different you know. There's so many different differences that you can put in there, but if you uh, teach them up front that they need to respect and that the idea that everyone's different. Right, people, fostering yeah. the idea that every student is different and we're all different and we all come from different values and beliefs and having a, a lesson on that before you even have to have a conversation, um, I think is really important. I know my teachers did that where it was just a lesson about that we're all different and we all think differently um, and we all come from different backgrounds and it's important to respect each other. So without kind of, um, you know targeting that and and creating units too that you know it, it's volleyball sitting down right without the use of your legs so fostering kind of 
um, programs that allow everyone to succeed and that it's okay to be different and individuals that are different are, are uh, stronger in other ways that people might be weaker. So um, it's kind of um, getting on top of those conversations before they even become um, an issue. Now, unfortunately, they still happen. Even though yeah. you, even though you front load it and try and uh, prevent that from even happening, sometimes it happens. So if that were to happen in my classroom, uh, I, I would uh, not call that student out uh, in front of the entire class. Probably, depending on the level of it, I would probably try and deal with that person individually, uh, let them know that it's not okay and that it's not going to happen anymore, and why. Um, and then as far as the student that's, uh, you know, being picked on, bullied, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, typically, we have students in our uh, classes that I would call more student leaders. Uh, and again, right from the beginning, um, you know, those student leaders are taught by us that if there are any issues that, you know, maybe it's time for them to step in and step up. So quite often we will have our, our student leaders all of a sudden, you know, they see that happening and they quite often will go over and say, hey, Michaela, you're on my team. Mm -hmm. So if you've kind of got some, you know, like a, have some allies in your in your yeah. community and in your class and teach people what allies are, um, I think that's really really important. And that's even creating groups, right, in your in your school that are allies and and um, can be support systems for people that might be going through that. So kind of three things: front load, have allies, and deal with it uh, as politically correctly as you can uh, mm -hmm. when it does happen by not allowing it. You, you clearly can't allow that to happen at any point. Hope that <laughs> So we're at 1, uh, 1 1 p.m. So uh, we'll have to finish the session uh, right now, but uh, there are so many positive feedback that I'm reading. Um, and uh, uh, so let's finish with this question uh, from Kathy. Will you offer any more PD sessions? <laughs> in the near future because uh, I really enjoyed this session. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Sierra Ontario, I mean, unfortunately, we're in a situation now where uh, conferences aren't happening. Uh, Sierra Ontario uh, has, it comes to every province. We, I personally have presented uh, in all 10 provinces uh, at, uh, you know, things like SPIA and HPAC and PSIC and TAPE, uh, like all of them. We've all been there. So yes, we are at all of those. Uh, we're hoping that we will get to do, we were online to do a, uh, an active workshop at, uh, in PEI this year. Uh, we're hoping uh, that we'll be able to do another one hopefully when it happens next year um, and also if you have ideas of what you want to learn more about or hear um, shoot us an email because that helps us too yeah. um, if and where we're posting things um, on Twitter and on our Instagram and things like that 